Yeah. Well, I can tell you that. That's SMF. It was pretty traumatic getting that going because um, when I went to the studio that day, Glenn John said, uh, well, let's do this song SMF. And I said, uh, well, what do you want me to do? You want me to play the guitar part or the harmonica part? And he said, well, you should just do it together. And I said, I've never done that before. I don't know how to do that. And, you know, I'm an average harp player at best, you know, but... Um, and he, but he was a you know an instigator, uh, a nudger. He is the kind of producer that that tries to get the artist to go into a new space and and try something different. He's done that with the greatest musicians the last 50, 60 years. So I said okay. So we set up. It was a you know that's a, a live recording. Suddenly had to learn how to play harmonica and guitar simultaneously and. Uh, so I, I was very pleased with it, although it sounded much rougher, let's say, than the kind of recordings that I did with his younger brother, Andy George. Yeah, Horns of Locust. That, it, it's, it's a funny thing, you know, my, uh, this goes way back to when I was a kid. I, uh, I remember this one day, uh, well, first of all, I have to know that but my dad was a very intelligent guy, and he, and he had a different way of speaking sometimes when he was uh, hanging out with us, uh, and uh, so we, he took us to the beach one day, and we were maybe, I'm guessing, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old, me and a bunch of my friends, and it was really crowded at the beach. This would have been Jones Beach on Long Island, and we all get out of the car, and my father remarked about how crowded it was, but the way that he said it was, he said, people are have descended on this beach like a horde of locusts. <laughs> and uh, my friends never let me forget about it. They, they loved my dad. They thought it was really cool, but they just thought it was even stranger than the phrases he would come up with. He would never say, wow, it's crowded. He just wouldn't say it that way. He would say, people have descended on this beach like a horde of locusts. So uh, that particular record, I was doing a lot of things that were sort of in jokes between me and my childhood friends, including the title of the album, which uh, Not of the Search was really a nod to a, a really bad B-movie from 1959 that my friends and I had memorized because it was so funny, right. unintentionally. And it was a movie called Not of the Search. And I, I titled the album that thinking that if I released the album and my friends saw it, wherever they were, they would get in contact with me. <laughs> and I had my, my address on the back of the album. Okay. It was purely a calling card, like a me waving a flag or sending a message in a bottle just to friends from school that I'd lost track of. Yeah, that's a chicken foot song. Yep. Um, that song uh, started out being called Open Your Heart, I think that's what we call it. Okay. One of the very first writing sessions I had with Sam was at his studio, and I came in and I said, you know, Sam, I think what I'm missing from you is, is you know, instead of uh, the big happy Sam trying to get everybody uh, on, their, on their feet, you know, um, just being like the party guy, um, what if, um, you know, we, we had a song where um, it was just sort of you reaching out to people sort of like one-on-one. -on -one. Okay. And um, so I'm talking about the song Learning to Fall. Yep. And um, so I had this song called um, Open Your Heart to Love. And, and I imagined Sammy walking out on stage with an acoustic guitar and all by himself singing a song about the hardships of life and but no matter what happens, you have to open your heart to love. And so he really loved the song, but he looked at the lyrics and he gave me one of those looks like, well, you can't sing that. And, you know, the thing that's cool about Sam is that he is such a great lead singer that he has a, a perfect instinct for what is singable and what is not. And, of course, I don't <laughs> because I'm not a lead singer. I can sing a teeny bit, right. you know, but I, I actually don't have the sensibility of a lead singer. Uh, but he does because he's a communicator, and that's sure. what good lead singers have to know how to communicate so they can look at a bunch of lyrics and go, you know, nice story, but you, that, you just can't sing that, you know. Mm -hmm. So he turned it around and he made it more personal. He made it about his relationship uh, with his wife, about how 
when when he screws up, he really screws up bad, and he comes crawling back to his wife, and he's lucky to have her. Yeah. Uh, Groove. Yeah, right? Yeah, you're too good at this game. <laughs> Good thing I'd be worried if I didn't recognize it. Yeah, most people can't. So, uh, really expanding my horizons and trying to come up with different ways of writing songs. And one day I was, I, yeah, I can't really explain why, but I was improvising along with a, um, a Lauren Hill record. You know, just sort of jamming around with it, you know. And um, there was this one section that was just a beat and and a kind of a funny glue and I thought, oh this is really this is really interesting. It makes me feel about something about about hanging out with friends and something and so I just sort of uh, kept the tempo and part of the swing and I had to kind of redo the, the pattern. And but I, the melody that I was using to play on top of uh, uh, Lauren Hill's sort of rap scat soul thing she was doing on it uh, wound up being a really strong melody so I constructed a song basically around this little do 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 it's really right. like a horn pattern really you know right um, it's not really a guitar line um, but I thought it was really unusual so but that's how that's why I called it Hill Groove just cause I just thought I ought to say thank you to Lauren Hill for the original inspiration <laughs> yeah, see if I could fly. Yeah, yeah. That, one. Um, that song I started writing on uh, when we were uh, on the Flying the Blue Dream tour. I mean, that song goes way back. Uh, I was writing it while I was on tour, and I just kept working on it and working on it. Every year, I just kept working on that song, and um, I always thought that it would work if the melody was so strong that it was completely singable and I would work on material with no lead playing, no melody fingering, you know what I mean? It would just be strumming and singing. And if I could, if I could edit the melody down to where it was completely singable, then I would, then I, and only then would I attempt to convince myself that the song was finished, that the melody was strong enough. And I purposely didn't practice playing it either. And so we're talking now uh, 10 years plus, right? And uh, I get to work on on that song, and I thought to myself, this is the record where it's going to happen. I'm going to put this song on a record. I'm going to finish this song, and, you know, it, uh, if it kills me. Uh, and I was pretty confident that I could do it. So the recording that you hear on the album, is actually one take the, from the, the beginning of the song to the breakdown before the long solo starts. That's that very first attempt at playing the melody, solo melody of the song. Tell me, tell me about the, so obviously the the big one of the big sort of controversies is obviously the the part that were uh, that was maybe Nick that the Coldplay maybe nicked part of it. Well, tell me about that element of it. Oh, I can't tell you anything about that. As a matter of fact, the only thing I can say yeah. is no comment. 